happens to be um, World Rare Disease Day, and there are a number of rarer uh, headache disorders. A few that we thought uh, would be worth shedding some light on today are some of the painful cranial neuropathies. So if you're actually uh, thinking about different kinds of headache, and there are hundreds of different kinds of headaches, um, there are headaches that primarily affect most of your head, headaches that affect one side or the other, and headaches that affect more superficial areas of the head, and we're going to talk about some of those and some of the more common, even though this is rare disease day, uh, um, some of the more common, less common disorders. So first, just a little bit about me. As Shoshana said, I'm a neurologist and headache specialist uh, in New York City. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of the um, uh, Department of Neurology in the Division of Headache Medicine at NYU. Um, I finished a headache medicine fellowship at Jefferson, and I'm the medical director of NeuroHealth, which is a, a virtual headache clinic that basically allows us to come to you and to see you uh, and to treat any of the, you know, many different kinds of headache disorders you may have. And we try to provide our expertise even for some of these rare headache uh, disorders and diseases uh, for you uh, in the most efficient way. So first, just a word in general about facial pain and other, you know, headache pain disorders that are not exactly what you would typically categorize as headaches. If you actually look in the international classification of headache disorders, which is how headache specialists um, basically determine what your diagnosis is, um, there are different categories based on whether you fit into a migraine subtype, um, a family that is in the cluster headache-like uh, uh, headaches, which are called the tax or trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. There are secondary headache disorders. And then there are what are called painful cranial neuropathies. These are uh, distinct headache dis uh, diagnoses that affect the head and the face in ways different than most other kinds of headaches. Um, these kinds of pain are, uh, the reason why we call them neuropathies is because there is more of a nervy pain quality to it. Um, and some can be due to issues intracranial, some extracranial, some are basically inside the skull, similar to how migraine uh, and other headache disorders can cause that kind of pain, and some very superficial and extracranial. We'll talk about both. The treatments of these disorders vary significantly, and that's why it's very important to actually get the right diagnosis. You'll see even among these uh, categories of headache disorders, the treatments are very different and they vary significantly from migraine or tension type headache or, you know, cluster headache, etc. So first to talk a little bit about trigeminal neuralgia and what it basically is, is a one-sided electric shock like pain that is very short lasting. It starts and ends abruptly when we talk about the trigeminal nerve, what that means, trigeminal means three branches. The first branch it basically uh, uh, supplies innervation or pain sensation around the eye. The second uh, along the upper jaw and the third along the lower jaw. And you can see the blue, the green, and the you know kind of magenta purple over here, the three different divisions of the trigeminal nerve over here. And for the most part, although it is possible to have trigeminal neuralgia that affects the uh, top of the head and the forehead, much more commonly trigeminal neuralgia affects the second and third divisions, the upper or lower jaw, and it is commonly triggered. What we mean by that is normal activities provoke severe, this abrupt kind of pain. Uh, it can be things like washing your face, shaving, smoking, or talking, brushing your teeth. Um, it often does happen even spontaneously. And a typical presentation of trigeminal neuralgia is what we would describe for the most part as provoked. And a more atypical form of trigeminal neuralgia would be more constant and continuous with a baseline pain over that area that can sometimes exacerbate 
with these triggers. Now, how to make the diagnosis? This is from that book that I was talking to you about, the International Classification of Medic Disorders. This is obviously in, you know, uh, um, you know, a, a more medical speak. Paroxysmal means comes and goes. But again, this is you know short lasting. What it's describing are short lasting from seconds to minutes, um, a pain that affects a division. Uh, or sometimes more than one division of that trigeminal nerve. Um, they are stereotyped, they are intense, they are typically de described as stabbing, and they are typically triggered. Um, importantly, if you look at uh, criteria D, there is no evident neurological deficit, which means when you actually look at somebody's face, they can move it, and they don't have any other neurological issues associated with this pain. They aren't necessarily experiencing tearing, they aren't experiencing running of the nose or that side of their face becoming very flush. In that situation, we might think about other kinds of headache. Uh, importantly also, people think about you know, facial paralysis. This is actually not associated with any movement disorder of the face for the most part, although it can be painful and sometimes you want to move that side of the face less. Um, the, the motor distribution uh, to the face is actually intact. So what does it look like if somebody has it? As I was talking to you before, these are people who, uh, who, who will uh, frequently have uh, pain, sometimes triggered by, like I was saying before, normal activity or even the wind. Uh, we talked about idiopathic, uh, which is how we would describe um, a trigeminal neuralgia that happens just because, and that is more common as patients get older. If somebody uh, is presenting in their 40s or 50s, for the most part, that kind of trigeminal neurology is much more common. There can sometimes be structural causes. And what I mean by that is uh, oftentimes the first thing that one of your uh, doctors will do is they'll want to get an MRI of the brain. And it's not so much that they're necessarily looking uh, to see if there's an aneurysm or a brain tumor that could be causing this, it's because there can be sometimes very, very subtle things, even a tiny little extra blood vessel, like a loop around that nerve that over years can start to cause this kind of pain. Uh, sometimes in somebody who has multiple sclerosis, a demyelinating plaque, which is how a multiple sclerosis presents, can occur instead of in the brain on that nerve. And as I said before, there really should be no muscle weakness. Um, and like we were talking about before, there are atypical and typical uh, presentations of trigeminal neuralgia. And sometimes, you know, diseases don't always read textbooks. You may present with only some of these features. And sometimes we call that a trigeminal neuropathy. And when we think about treatment, we think about what uh, may, uh, tr you know, really go after this kind of headache best. The mainstay of treatment for the most part are going to be uh, medications, specific kinds of anti-seizure medicines. They go by the names of carbamazepine or tegretol, oxcarbazepine or trileptal. That's one family. Sometimes people will use another kind that's called gabapentin. That's a little bit less specific for facial pain disorders. Some muscle relaxants like baclofen actually may help because they actually work more on nerves than on muscles. The whole term muscle relaxant is a little bit of a misnomer. They actually work on, on nerves, not so much on muscles. There are some injections that can sometimes be helpful. The SPG, which um, if you can see my cursor, is this large nerve, kind of looks a little bit like a star that sits way in the back of the nose that can sometimes be targeted. There are a number of different procedures that are, you know, that, that, that all could basically try to get some kind of lidocaine or medicine in the lidocaine family right into that area to numb that area. If you do see um, that, you know, vascular loop, sometimes um, glycerol, which is a kind of alcohol, can be injected into that area, usually by a neurosurgeon. Sometimes, and this is very unfortunate if this is the case, if a person has tried many medicines, and nothing really works significantly, we can actually consider surgical uh, procedures to you know, help, especially if there is an anatomical cause, if there's something structural that is leading to this kind of pain. Uh, gamma knife radiation is 
not a real surgery. Gamma knife is uh, a, a kind of radio frequency uh, radiation that can be done on a millimeter basis, even just to the area where that blood vessel and nerve are touching each other. It can scar the nerve. And, there, that, and by doing that, that area doesn't have the irritation that it had before. Sometimes it can cause worsening pain um, you know, just after the surgery, sometimes for weeks or even months afterwards. So it can be, it can feel worse before it feels better. Another surgical procedure is called microvascular decompression, where a neurosurgeon would actually physically separate the blood vessel and the nerve. Oftentimes they would put something to separate those two areas in between. Usually microvascular decompression cannot be done after gamma knife. And there are certain anatomical situations where one approach would be better than the other. If this ever does, you know, uh, you know, happen to be the case, it usually makes sense to get the uh, opinion of, uh, you know, both a neurosurgeon that specializes in the surgery and a neurosurgeon that specializes in radiation to get both of their opinions regarding which may be necessary. That being said, this is really only something that's considered if you have tried and not done well on multiple you know, other preventive options, including medications, injections, et cetera. Now talking about another kind of uh, painful cranial neuropathy. And if you actually ask uh, your neurologists or headache specialists, uh, some of them may even, uh, you know, doubt the existence of, you know, this phenomenon. And it's not that it doesn't exist, but they will say that it exists in specific contexts. So what is occipital neuralgia? What is this thing that people debate about that definitely people experience? It is a jabbing or sometimes stabbing kind of pain, and it is in the occipital area. Occipital means back of the head. The occipital lobes of the brain are the back of the brain. The occipital region of the back of the head has nerves, called the greater and lesser occipital nerves, as you can see from the picture. There's even a tiny little branch called the third occipital nerve. And um, the muscles that these nerves run in are called the occipitalis muscles. Um, a person can sometimes um, experience even a decrease of sensation in that area behind the head or an abnormal burning sensation behind the head instead sometimes of the jabbing that comes and goes. They may, you know, things just may feel very off or in other words, normal sensation feels different or you can even feel burning uh, on a near constant basis. And oftentimes there's tenderness over those nerves. Uh, oftentimes if you go to your uh, headache specialist for the first time, they will be putting their hands all the way in the back of your head and you'll be like, how oh, that really hurts, please don't do that. And the doctor will say, I'm so sorry, but I just have to check to see if you're tender in those areas right by the nerves. So how do we make a diagnosis of occipital neuralgia? Um, uh, this again comes from the uh, ICHD, the International Classification of Headache Disorders. So this is the technical definition. Paroxysmal means it comes and goes. You can have paroxysmal coming and going stabbing pain. You can have this with or without persistent aching in between the, the, the jabs and the distributions of any of the uh, occipital nerves. And there is tenderness over the affected nerve. The reason why I wanted to show you this is because what is very important over here is criteria C. In order to make the diagnosis, you actually have to do a local anesthetic block of the nerve, something that's called an occipital nerve block. So even if the pain only temporarily improves in that area, especially that tenderness, you can make this diagnosis, but you have to actually do the injection in order to make that diagnosis. So what does occipital neuralgia look like? It is typically reproducible pain, which is why the doctor will push their thumbs back against the back of your head and they will say, does it hurt when I, you know, does this feel like the pain that you're experiencing as I'm pushing because they're trying to reproduce that pain? Um, and like I was saying before, in order to actually make the diagnosis, likely your doctor will want to uh, actually perform this occipital nerve block. They're going to say, what we should try to do is uh, do an injection into the areas where those nerves live and see if we're able to take the pain away. If we do, 
we have you know, established this diagnosis. What is it that's being injected? Typically a mixture of different kinds of lidocaine into at least two areas in the back of your head. Um, if you only have pain on one side, then it'll just be on one side. Again, those two areas, the greater and lesser occipital nerves. What's important to distinguish this from is pain in the back of the head versus pain by the base of the neck where the neck and the, and the bottom of the head meet each other. That's really not where the occipital nerve lives. And you can have a lot of pain over there that's usually more related to neck pain or a cervicogenic headache, which is something we can definitely talk about some other time. And other kinds of treatment like physical therapy might be best for something like that, as opposed to um, doing and diagnosing an, uh, um, um, uh, occipital neuralgia with this occipital nerve block. So treatments and also, you know, you know what, what's, what's the perspective? So it's thought to be due to, because those muscles, those occipitalis muscles have these nerves that are running inside of them, it can, be, it can be due to trauma or entrapment of these nerves inside the muscles themselves as the muscles contract. Oftentimes, people who have chronic headache disorders like chronic migraine or chronic tension type headache can have so much muscle spasm and pericranial muscle tenderness that those those muscles can start to, um, you know, entrap the, the, the nerves that way. And one of the reasons why there are definitely some, uh, you know, uh, uh, headache doctors that I know that don't believe that occipital neurology exists is because what they will say is they will say it doesn't exist as its own entity. It always exists as part of something greater, usually chronic migraine, potentially chronic tension type headache, or maybe even cervicogenic headache, but they would say it isn't necessarily its own thing. These are kind of semantics, but this is what headache doctors kind of live for, you know, these kinds of, of debates. Um, it's possible that you might just need a nerve block and feel a lot better afterwards. That does happen for some people. Medications that can help uh, can be as needed muscle relaxants, sometimes anti-inflammatories, again, for exacerbations of pain. We do sometimes think about prevention when you have pain that's near constant or that burning sensation. There are uh, medications that obviously, if you do have an underlying headache disorder in addition to the occipital neuralgia that's really driving it, obviously treating that could be best. Similarly, the TCA class of antidepressants, which are amitriptyline and nortriptyline, can be very helpful, especially for migraine and tension type headache. If you've never been on a preventive, that can oftentimes be very, very helpful. Uh, some anti-seizure medicines can be helpful either to help prevent the underlying uh, diagnosis, for instance, topiramate or Depakote or maybe arguably gabapentin for migraine. Um, and uh, for nerve pain itself, some anti-seizure medications even like gabapentin can sometimes be helpful. Uh, stretching and massage can be very helpful actually as part of uh, neurohealth. Now, one of the things uh, that we have started to develop are care plans and one of the care plans that uh, we have, um, depending on whether your underlying diagnosis is, you know, migraine, tension type headache, or cervicogenic headache, we actually have different like mini PT programs that you can take that help you stretch and strengthen a lot of the corresponding nerves uh, and muscles, and that can be very, very helpful. Massage usually feels better too. Anyway, it has been a pleasure talking about these two uh, subjects with uh, all of you. I'm happy to take any questions uh, about uh, this topic. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just pull myself back onto the screen. I was like frantically taking notes and people are submitting questions uh, while we were going through it um, already. So I know I told you that we already had about 19 questions. We're like, Closer to 30 right now. Wow. Um, so obviously a hot topic. Um, and just to let people know, you know, we'll do our best to get through all the questions, but I'm sure we'll have Dr. Burt come back at another time and um, maybe just talk about some other types of facial pain as well and other things sure. that are going on. So we don't want anyone to feel that we didn't hear you. We just uh, also need to be mindful of time. So thank you so much for that presentation. So uh, I, I thought one of the most interesting things you said was that some doctors believe that occipital neuralgia doesn't exist 
by itself. It only exists as part of something else, which um, could, whether or not that is true, as I think you pointed out that doctors live for this kind of discussion, um, <laughs> which definitely makes it challenging for patients, but also fascinating. But that would explain why people who have chronic migraine often have all these this occipital pain as well. Okay. okay. So that would be the relation. So that was the first question. What is the relationship between the occipital nerve and migraine? Um, and it sounds like they're kind of inextricably intertwined, especially by the time you have chronic migraine. Would that be fairly accurate? Yes, very much so. Um, you know, it's also not just migraine. You know, oftentimes any kind of, you know, chronic headache disorder, whether it's migraine or like I was saying before, tension headache, people have chronic cluster, et cetera. Um, you can have so much muscle tension that that can start to cause irritation and, entra and entrapment of those uh, nerves in the muscles. Okay, interesting. That's really interesting. Now, now my, this may be a completely different topic, in which case just let me know and we'll schedule for another one. But sure. uh, obviously a lot of people with migraine, they have occipital nerve blocks, but some people also have supraorbital nerve blocks, auricular nerve blocks. And I know there's another one I can't remember right now, but the supraorbital and the auricular, that isn't to do with the occipital nerve or the trigeminal nerve, is it, or is it? Well, the occipital nerves do run from the back of the head up towards the front. The, if you feel in your eyebrows, there are little ridges and there are two by the corners of your eyebrows, two in the middle. Those are the supratrochlear and supraorbital nerves that run this way. They run from the front of the head towards the back. And you wouldn't necessarily do an occipital nerve block for pain in the front alone. And you wouldn't necessarily do a supraorbital and supratrochlear nerve block for pain in, you know, in the back alone. Um, oftentimes people may get basically an entire, you know, head, uh, you know, nerve block uh, situation. If let's say you're in status migranosis, if you have a severe migraine that's just not getting better, and we're trying to do everything that we can to acutely treat uh, and calm down the pain, usually that will be in addition to like some of the things that we had been talking about in some of the prior, um, uh, you know, uh, speeches like. Uh, taking a steroid or an anti-inflammatory medicine, something to break a really bad headache. So usually in addition to that, you'll be getting, you know, th those nerve blocks. But over here, if the pain specifically is in the back of the head, you probably would not be getting auriculotemporal, which are the ones by the temples, or supraorbital and supratrochlear nerve blocks. Okay. Uh, the, one, the one exception I would say might be uh, a, a case in pregnancy, for instance, where we're trying to avoid all systemic exposure of medications using something like lidocaine, which has basically the safest level, um, uh, you know, as per the FDA in pregnancy, uh, doing something like that, even sometimes regularly, might be, uh, you know, worth considering if you're somebody who's really not doing well uh, with migraine in pregnancy. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so a couple of questions about that. If someone has pain from the supraorbital and the supraorbital nerves, because the occipital nerve comes up over the back of your head, does that nerve, the nerves at the front, can they trigger that occipital nerve or are they really entirely different entities? And I guess the same thing, the same question would be for the trigeminal nerve. To what extent are these triggered by each other? I think that they aren't necessarily triggering each other. So it isn't so much that if you have a lot of pain in the front of the head, that means at some point you'll have pain towards the back of the head. That being said, if you have headache chronically, you know, uh, on, on an almost daily basis, absolutely that will affect you and that will start to lead to um, muscle tension all around the head, you know, regardless. And um, that muscle tension, you know, will, will affect oftentimes some of the nerves on the outside of the head. The supraorbital and supratrochlear nerves for the most part aren't going to be affected as much at least by uh, other headache disorders because they really are not enmeshed in muscle as much as the others are. Um, so that's why I wouldn't necessarily say that they frequently uh, will, will play into each other. Um, it's definitely possible for somebody to have chronic migraine and to have everything very, you know, tender, 
uh, and to have a lot of pain that way. And that's why in that kind of situation, like status migranosis, they might just block everything. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. So when it comes down to those nerve blocks, and then I, I have a lot of questions about TN as well, but when it comes down to the occipital nerve blocks, we hear from a lot of people in our groups. I know it's also my own experience that having um, some steroid added into those injections makes the difference. Um, but is that a common thing or is that, is that, is that a, a disputed thing? I see you smiling very, about it. <laughs> very disputed. Interesting. Very disputed. And for the most part, even though you would think that yes, a steroid would make a big difference. First of all, it wouldn't necessarily help diagnostically. Diagnostically, you really only need and should be injecting, um, you know, uh, an anesthetic like a lidocaine type medicine. Um, but there are definitely issues with uh, injecting a steroid under your skin. Um, like I was saying before, with lidocaine, for the most part, we aren't worried about systemic issues. With steroids, we definitely are. Um, and the amount of steroid that you could be injecting can definitely affect you long term, uh, sometimes for long periods of time. Oftentimes, you'll hear whether it's an injection, you know, in the head or in a joint like the shoulder or the knee or, you know, wherever. If you, when you hear about people who are getting a steroid injection, you'll hear their doctor saying, well, we can only do this a few times a year. And the reason why is because there is a significant systemic exposure to steroid that these injections are giving. And more than that, in a, a steroid injection uh, injected under the skin can cause significant issues. It can cause alopecia, which means hair loss under the skin. It can cause discoloration under the skin. It can break down some of the subcutaneous fat under the skin. So I would say with uh, uh, maybe one or two exceptions, uh, most headache specialists will really avoid uh, using steroids. Instead of a steroid, what likely we will use is a combination of short and long-acting versions of, of lidocaine. For instance, lidocaine and something called bupivacaine. That is something that definitely lasts a lot longer than the lidocaine. Um, also will not necessarily have systemic effects. Um, it won't be necessarily safe in pregnancy. Um, it just has one degree you know, worse than lidocaine uh, as the FDA categorizes it in pregnancy, but it can still be, uh, you know, used safely multiple times, you know, a, a, you know, a year or even a month uh, if necessary. Right. And that's really good to know because I know we hear from a lot of people that they are nervous about getting pregnant, scared of getting pregnant, or just decided they're not going to have children because they have migraine. And so it's, it's really good to know, you know, that there are options out there. That's important. Now, we've had a number of questions from people who want to know uh, if they have trigeminal neuralgia that was triggered by dental work or by neck surgery, for example, is the prognosis for that any different? And is the treatment for that any different? The treatment really isn't different. And the prognosis also is not necessarily different. And it is actually definitely the case that sometimes procedures, whether they are dental procedures whether they are, I, I mean, it's even been reported in the literature, cataract surgery, um, things that can, you know, sometimes, you know, send a lot of, uh, you know, pain signaling through that nerve that may already be a little irritated at baseline, even if, especially if structurally there's that little loop, um, you know, even if you haven't had any symptoms up until now, uh, you can have basically, you know, a seminal event that leads to this pain starting up. Uh, it really, for the most part, doesn't change anything, you know, prognostically or treatment-wise. And you know, we do wonder sometimes um, the the procedure that leads people, let's say, to get the dental work done, whether that could sometimes represent, uh, you know, some of that trigeminal nerve pain to begin with, and then everything just exacerbates over time, or whether that it was something completely and totally different. Right. That's interesting. Um, so actually, that kind of takes me on to the next question, which somebody asked, you know, if medication for TN is helpful to them, is it ever safe or wise to wean off those medications, especially for people who take a lot of medications and want to reduce that? Or is that just asking for trouble? It is not necessarily asking for trouble. And in general, you know, we speak so much about what medicines to start. And oftentimes, 
patients don't ever hear us talking about, you know, when it's time for medications to be over. And in general, the goal, whether you're starting a medicine for migraine, for TN, or for anything, really is, you know, is this a lifelong condition that the patient has to be on forever? And there may be some people that will have to be on something preventively forever. And many people, especially if you respond very well to preventive medication, after a uh, you know, a certain period of time, and I'll talk about exactly what that might be. Yeah, we definitely can talk about discontinuing the medication, weaning and discontinuing it. The question is really how long, and it's enough for the doctor and the patient to be, um, you know, really, um, you know, uh, to, 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 you know, be sure enough that, you know, this pain disorder has you know, kind of moved itself through. So let's say you've been symptomatic for six months. You were finally able to see a doctor, start a medication, and it worked for you. The doctor would probably say, I would want you to be on this medicine for a minimum of six months with basically pain freedom. So it may take, let's say, a few weeks or even a month or two to get to the right dose and then to maintain it. And for the most part, the answer is how long should you be on it? The minimum should be about as long as things were bad for. If things were really bad for a year or two, it might mean you should be on it for that long. If you're really doing fantastically well after even a relatively short period of time, it, you might you may want to discuss with the doctor, at least, you know, uh, dialing back the dose of the medication and seeing how you're doing. You could always go back up. Right, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to presume that the answer to this question is yes, but it sounds like it's a trial and error method for finding the right treatment, just as it is with migraine, the same with, with ON, but specifically TN. Or is there like a structured approach that every doctor follows for treatment of that? I would say with trigeminal neuralgia, it's much more structured than with just about anything else because the, the two anti-seizure medicines, for the most part, are, are, are going to be the ones that are used. They're basically equivalent. One may be a little bit better tolerated than the, than the other. Sometimes you may have an insurance that prefers one over the other, but for the most part, you'll be starting likely on either carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine, which are very similar uh, medications. And th that really is not something that we see a lot of variations from. The question would be, if you don't respond at that point, is the answer going to be to add on another anti-seizure medicine, to try an injection, to try a medicine in a completely different family, like an anti-inflammatory, um, you know, etc. cetera. Um, occipital neuralgia, there really is, I would say, a much less standardized approach, even more so than migraine, oftentimes because doctors, you know, for instance, uh, will sometimes be delayed in making the diagnosis even, um, figuring out what the underlying cause might be. Um, all of those factors can definitely play into, you know, whether your doctor is going to say, okay, we're just going to do a nerve block and then, you know, we'll see how you do, you know, a month later, your doctor may be very aggressive. Your doctor may see that there are, you know, that this is tied to, you know, more maybe a, a cervicogenic type headache pain. What you really need are exercises and, you know, really great PT uh, or something else. So I would say, especially because so many other factors could play a role with occipital neuralgia, it's much less standardized with trigeminal neuralgia, much more. That's interesting. So um, besides the medications and then ultimately surgery, if, if nothing else works, um, do medical devices ever help? For example, the vagus nerve stimulator or even the new migraine device which stimulates the trigeminal and the occipital nerve. Is there any relevance to trigeminal neuralgia and or occipital neuralgia or really not? Uh, the devices were never really studied in those conditions specifically. Um, the one thing I would say, especially with the newest device, which is called Relivian, which is very similar to the Cephaly device that I think many people are familiar with, but also has, you know, uh, electrodes in the back of the head specifically to stimulate the greater and lesser occipital nerves. I'd be very curious to see how well people with occipital uh, neuralgia do uh, with, uh, with that device. But because there haven't been any studies specifically studying those conditions, we just don't know. Yeah, that would be really interesting. And I know that they're doing some preventive studies for that device as well. So uh, it may just come out that it's anecdotal. Before studies are ever done specifically on these diseases, we may find that people with migraine who have TN and ON incidentally say, by the way, I use this device and- Exactly. Right? 
that's what I would expect to see first. Um, so are there any new treatments on the horizon for either of these, you know, anything in clinical trials or is this kind of an un, under-researched, uh, underdeveloped area? Uh, there are always some clinical trials that are usually small scale and oftentimes, you know, in fact, what we call investigator initiated, which means that we'll have either residents or, you know, fellows in academic institutions that say, you know, let's try either different protocols of injections or sometimes potentially trying other, you know, off-label uses of, of medications for these disorders. Um, there really, for the most part, aren't, you know, the kinds of major trials from drug makers that we hear about um, because today is like rare disease day. One of the reasons why rare disease day is important is because oftentimes it's the rare diseases that don't get a lot of press that are things that oftentimes, you know, large manufacturers aren't as aware of and certainly, you know, are, are you know, less uh, you know, of, of a priority, unfortunately uh, for them. But uh, we, we definitely will have, you know, uh, people who are interested. One of my uh, diplomas, you'll see this one over here, was actually for, uh, you know, a study that, um, you know, I proposed at Jefferson uh, with Dr. Bill Young, who I think a lot of people over here, uh, you know, uh, know from his uh, advocacy work, specifically looking at uh, occipital uh, nerve blocks. So, uh, uh, you know, it, you know we, 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 we've done... I, I would say, you know, similar, you know, scale, uh, you know, small trials, but things that can sometimes make a significant impact. Yeah, that, that's really good to know. And obviously, this is why we scheduled you for today, while we asked you to take time out of your clinical practice, uh, because it is rare disease day and trigeminal neuralgia is a rare disease. Um, uh, is occipital neuralgia also considered a rare disease or not so much? I think that's up for debate. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, is that debatable as well? <laughs> I think it's. I think it's extremely debatable, especially you know many of my colleagues and mentors who would say that occipital neuralgia really only happens when there's something else that's underlying occipital. They would say that it is a symptom rather than a disease. That would be their um, you know their argument, and uh, you know in that situation, I would say you probably can't call it that, but certainly you know. Uh, occipital neuralgia as a disease itself would likely be considered a rare disease. Okay, so just to muddy the waters, no yes. black and white there, it's just gray, which is what a lot of neurology kind of kind of exists in. So I have some questions specifically about trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, so one person asked, does the trigeminal nerve have anything to do with sinus pain? There are branches of the trigeminal nerve in your sinuses. Um, Oftentimes, you know, it's, it's, you know you, you'll always hear, um, uh, you know, headache doctors say that the number one cause of sinus headaches is not the sinuses. It is migraine, much more than just about anything else. And likely some of the people that diagnose migraine more than anyone, you know, else, even sometimes more than neurologists, are ENT doctors. And the reason why is because people go to their ENT doctors and they say, you know, every so often I have these terrible headaches in my sinuses, and they say, this is migraine. You have a sensitivity to light and sound, and it switches back and forth. You know, there's nausea, this is, this is migraine, and they send, uh, the, you know, the patient in the right direction. So absolutely, the reason why, especially migraine, will present in the sinuses is because you have branches of the trigeminal nerve, which becomes inflamed, all these branches become inflamed during a migraine attack, and you'll have those symptoms uh, during migraine. Interesting. I just saw all the questions that came in. So uh, I do have someone feeding me the questions and we have a lot. We're going to do our best to get through them in the Absolutely. next 15 minutes. So, oh my goodness. Um, but this is really good. You know, it's good because you're hitting on a topic that's so important to people and it's very hard for people to get answers. So uh, the first question I'm going to ask you is what kind of doctor should a person see if, they're ex if they think they may have TN or ON? Is it a neurologist? Is it a headache specialist? Is it a pain management doctor? facial pain specialists, or any of the above? Yeah, for the most part, um, I, you know, we, we, a, a headache specialist would have seen more people with trigeminal, you know, and or occipital neuralgia than any of those other kinds of doctors, even more than pain specialists. Um, when we talk about facial pain specialists, 
for the most part, that, that's really what a headache specialist is. A headache specialist is somebody who specializes in headache and facial pain disorders. And uh, that's, that's why this is, you know, something that, you know, we're talking about in, you know, even though this is technically migraine meanderings, but, uh, you know, these are, these are cousin disorders. Um, general neurologists are great places to go, at least initially, especially if you can't get in to see um, a headache specialist soon. Um, you know, for the most part, I think you were saying, you know, pain medicine specialists, it's a little bit of a, header, of a, of a hit or miss. I think some, uh, you know, will, I think, have a better understanding of what might be an underlying headache disorder and some less so. So it really kind of depends. Uh, but ideally, a headache specialist would be the best person to see. Just to clarify for everybody who watches this now or on our YouTube channel, when we talk about our headache specialists and migraine meanderings, we're referring not to someone who just gives themselves the name of headache specialist, which is a lot of people, but we're talking to some about someone who is certified as a headache specialist, either with an AQH certification or with a UCNS certification, it means they've had pretty extensive training specifically in headache disorders and ongoing education as well. So it is unfortunate that uh, if you do a Google search for headache specialist, you will find a lot of doctors who actually are not. So it's really important to make sure that you're seeing a doctor who has that education. We do have a directory on our website, migrainemeanderings.com. Uh, maybe someone could put that in the comments as well. You can go to that resources and we're having that made into a database this year so that people have easy access to the current doctors who really can help treat this. So I just wanted to take a quick sidestep into that. A uh, question here was, can any of the CGRP inhibitors, they were specifically asking about the uh, injectables, have they ever been tested with TN? Or, or is that, I, I'm not sure why they asked that, but maybe they know something I don't know. They have not been, they, ha they, they have not been, although um, in, in Botox as well, uh, you know, only in, you know, uh, very, you know, small, you know, what we call, uh, you know, um, open label, you know, uh, trials Botox was for, for, for TN. And it wasn't necessarily shown to be effective, but it could just be that the protocol wasn't, uh, you know, uh, fully, uh, fleshed out. So there are un ongoing trials, uh, you know, for Botox specifically for the uh, CGRP inhibitors. Um, there really aren't. Uh, there haven't been. Uh, the one thing I will tell you is um, if the question is uh, surgery versus trying a CGRP inhibitor, most, especially a headache specialist, will have CGRP inhibitors um, in their office available as samples, and uh, it will be something that they will likely give you to try, because uh, like I was saying, we do want to avoid anything invasive as much as possible. Right, absolutely. And just to, just to clarify, you know, there's no such thing as the stupid question when it comes to migraine or facial absolutely. pain. There is so much that is not known. I thought maybe there's something I didn't know about this, but yes, it's as long as your doctor approves it, it's definitely worthwhile trying things that are non-invasive. Uh, versus invasive first. And there are a lot of options that we can try and there are constantly new options and new clinical trials as well. Um, so I want to go back to, I think I got through most of the questions that just came in just now, but going back to TN, maybe you could touch on really quickly about atypical trigeminal neuralgia, which I have a note here that says that is called classical trigeminal neuralgia. Um, how is that different from other forms of TN? Yeah, um, when, when you go, when you, when you actually look at subtypes of trigeminal neuralgia, it, it's very confusing because people are describing different things at different times. So classical will be if there's a tiny little vascular loop that runs right next to that uh, blood vessel. And that's what we would call technically classical trigeminal neuralgia. It actually doesn't, that's why classical and typical are very, are, are very, you know, they, they sound very similar, but, but they're actually describing different things. So classical refers to whether there's a structural abnormality and typical refers to whether there is baseline pain or not. Typical would be if there's no baseline pain and atypical would technically be if there is baseline pain and those exacerbations that are superimposed on top of it. In the end, how differently are these subtypes treated? Not really that differently. Um, I would say that we might be a little bit more aggressive with regards to um, the, the dosage and treatment uh, of the anti-epileptic medicines, anti-seizure medicines like uh, 
um, you know, uh, carbamazepine, you know, uh, oxcarbazepine, if you do have some degree of baseline pain, you would probably want to, you know, treat that a little bit more aggressively because you're constantly in pain. But that doesn't mean that somebody who isn't constantly in pain doesn't have something severe. Trigeminal neurology can be a very severe and debilitating uh, uh, condition in and of itself. Okay, interesting. So leads me right into the next question. Is, is TN pain always in the lower part of the face and shooting? Or can you get it higher up in your face? Can you get it behind your ears? You know, or is it very, very, or is that another area of dispute? No, you can get it in the second and third divisions. It's, you know, I would say 95 plus percent of the time in one or the other. You can have it in both, but it's very rarely around the eye. You really shouldn't be experiencing it behind the ear. That would be something very different. That would be, you know, and there are a number of even rarer headache disorders and facial, you know, pain, uh, you, know, nerve, you know, cranial, you know, nerve conditions that can cause that kind of pain. Um, sometimes severe TMJ can cause that kind of pain, especially dislocation or um, you know, arthropathy, arthritis of the joint can sometimes cause pain in, you know, in behind the ear. So that would be something that you would want to, you know, um, you know, definitely get the right diagnosis for. Because again, all these things are treated very, very differently, but um, you really should be experiencing it in one of the divisions of the trigeminal nerve. Okay, that's helpful to know. So really quick question. Uh, and this is very specific, but there will be some people out here it applies to for people who have hearing loss and wear co and have cochlear implants. Can that trigger trigeminal neuralgia? I would say usually not. Um, I, I, I would say that it could cause pain that would mimic trigeminal neuralgia. And it can be a very difficult, you know, call. Um, if the pain really only happens when the hearing aid is in, it may be that the hearing aid just needs to be refitted. And the pain that you're experiencing, you know, it's, it's just referred in general to this area, and you're experiencing a lot of pain all around superficially the ear, which, you know, like I was saying, can be referred to, to the upper or lower jaw areas. Um, I, I would say it's possible sometimes f just like a cataract surgery or dental, you know, procedures can sometimes actually trigger trigeminal neuralgia. It's possible that a procedure of the ears could also, that is possible. Okay. Um, last question about TN before I go back to um, occipital neuralgia. And we are in our last few minutes. If anybody else has questions, please put them in the comments right now so we can ask them. So there's a question here, does uh, trigeminal neuralgia cause high blood pressure? Being in pain can definitely cause high blood pressure. Trigeminal neuralgia would not directly cause high blood pressure, but being in pain certainly, certainly can. And, you know, elevated heart rate as well. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and then the, the uh, blocks, like the steroid blocks that are sometimes used for migraine, although not highly approved for migraine. Um, can that help trigeminal neuralgia as well? It depends which blocks you're, you're referring to. Um, if you're, for the most part, referring to those, you know, auriculotemporal and, um, you know, supraorbital, super, even your occipital nerve blocks, they really shouldn't make a difference at all with regards to trigeminal neuralgia. That SPG, the, the sphenopalatine ganglion right. nerve block, the thing that through the nose that I was describing before could. So if there's one nerve block to try either to add on, you know, to the medication or for somebody who can't take medication, you know, for whatever reason, sometimes alone, that can be effective. Right. And you're talking about the non-invasive SPG block. You're not talking about the implanted one, right? And so, so some people who may be nervous and thinking, wow, I'm going to have something put all the way up the back of my nose. Um, and maybe you're less nervous about this after being having had a nasal swab for the virus the past two years, but it's not that painful at all. Um, I have them done and, and they're uncomfortable, but uh, if they give you pain relief, then, then well worth asking, you know, your doctor about having that. So I just want to encourage people look into SPG block, you know, and talk to your doctor about that. If that, see if that may be appropriate for you uh, to go back quickly to occipital neuralgia. So people often describe uh, occipital nerve blocks as uh, liquid fire going up the back of their head. They're not pleasant. Um, 
is there any way to reduce that pain or is that just a facet of having that block? I would say for the most part, lidocaine itself does burn under the skin. You definitely, I would say as a doctor, want to make sure that you're not giving lidocaine with epinephrine. That could burn a lot more. So, um, you know, that, that's one of the things I would say. Uh, sometimes using lidocaine that's preservative free can also be, uh, you know, less irritating under the skin. Um, and uh, usually that burning, which is definitely uncomfortable, it usually does only last a few seconds. It can be yeah. very painful for a few seconds. And almost immediately afterwards, you do feel that numbness. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's definitely painful, you know, briefly. <laughs> uh, anytime, you know, you've ever had, let's say, lidocaine before mm -hmm. and are getting stitches done for a cut or something like that, you know, a lot of times you'll say the stitches didn't feel bad at all. That lidocaine shot, that was horrible. And the reason why is because the lidocaine shot made it so that way the stitches didn't hurt at all. Right, ab absolutely. And we do have some uh, comments every now and again or posts every now and again in our groups where people are thinking about getting these blocks and they'll come and talk about it. I did that before I had those blocks. And yes, you just had to take a deep breath and the pain is very short, but I mean, realistically it is gonna hurt, but, it, but it's very, very short lived. So um, just to let people know that the SPG block is not like that in case people are nervous about it again, not at all. A couple of questions here is, okay, so what if you feel numbness? Let's say for example, you have trigeminal neuralgia, and then the electric shock, sens shock sensations stop being electric shock sensations. And you're left with just a numbness and a dull pain. Is that still trigeminal neuralgia or do you no longer have TM? It would still be considered trigeminal neuralgia. It definitely would be. Um, and oftentimes people can have that sensation at least temporarily. And then usually it does revert back, but it would still be the same process that's causing that kind of pain. We would probably call it a typical trigeminal neuralgia. And oftentimes, like I was saying, you can still get exacerbations that are superimposed on top of either pain or numbness. Okay, interesting. Does that, uh, do those symptoms ever go down below? I mean, it looks like from the images, it only goes to here. It doesn't normally impact your throat or anywhere else. It's very localized. There is a similar disorder that's even rarer that's called glossopharyngeal neuralgia, which does affect the throat and sometimes part of the face. It affects a different cranial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, and um, it's, it's treated in a very similar way to how trigeminal neuralgia is treated. In that situation, absolutely you will feel throat pain, and it can sometimes be, you know, lower in the neck and you know, you can have some superficial pain. So I would say it could be that that's what you'd be experiencing. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it can be similarly treated, but a little bit more uh, refractory to the initial treatments of medicine. Okay, awesome. And that actually took me into a question I had here, which was to briefly touch on GPN, which you just did, but also GN. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what GN stands for. I know that Anna knows, um, but uh, ice pick to the ear pain? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to say, um, GN, I think is going to be like globus nerve. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the, on the <laughs> exact, you know, Latin form of the, of the, of the name, very, very difficult to treat. But again, so glossopharyngeal neuralgia looks much more like trigeminal neuralgia, but almost superimposed towards the throat, uh, and and you know certainly the the lower jaw area, and you know GN would be in the ear, and it would be something that is you know you would want to go to lengths to make sure that it isn't really due to either a jaw issue or some other problem in in the ear. So the imaging that we would do in that situation would, for the most part, be um, inner ear imaging. So it'd be an MRI with what's called IAC uh, protocols, which is the internal auditory canal, and uh, the treatment, and as well as sometimes an MRI of the actual, um, you know, uh, uh, temporomandibular joint. And uh, we would consider different kinds of um, anti-seizure medicines to, to numb that kind of, of nerve pain. That would be more like a gabapentin type uh, medication for that. Okay, super helpful. Uh, we have three questions left. 
Um, the first one is if you, actually we have four questions, I beg your pardon. We have two minutes to get through this really quickly. If, what if you have a bad reaction to ox, oxycarbazine? I'm not sure if I pronounced that correct. Um, then does that mean that you can no longer take medications in that class and you just need to you move on to different treatment options? I would say it really depends on what the um, on, 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 on what the, the, the reaction that you had was. You know, it could be that the reaction that you had was rash. And, you know, if that's the case, then it could be that a different kind of anti-epileptic would be effective. Um, if the problem was some other neurological issue, we may have to, you know, try a completely different kind of medication. Um, you know, if it was, and this can sometimes happen, especially in higher doses of carbamazepine, if it was that your sodium became very low, then we may want to avoid specifically carbamazepine, but oxcarbazepine may be something that you would tolerate a little bit better. So it really uh, kind of, uh, you know, is, is somewhat different. Okay. Um, next question is, um, quick thoughts. You have like 15 seconds for this, which I know isn't going to be possible, but we should do another talk actually maybe about surgeries. Um, decompression surgery, quick thoughts about that. A good option, bad option. Last sometimes it's the, yeah, sometimes it's the only option. And when it's the only option, that's what we would, uh, you know, recommend, but we always try to avoid that at all costs okay. if we can. Um, sometimes, and one of the main issues is it can be very effective. It can sometimes make the pain significantly worse. So, um, it's, it's definitely something that you would want to take some time before considering and consider with your neurologist slash headache specialist, in addition to oftentimes different kinds of surgeons. Okay, absolutely. So last question, um, please, everybody, if you have questions we haven't got to, please put them in the comments. Um, and um, we'll be able to send those to Dr. Burke and, and maybe get some answers for you for that. But for a lot of people who have migraines specifically, they have allodynia, sometimes very, very severe allodynia that can affect your scalp and your face. So how do you tell the difference between very severe allodynia and something that is more nerve-based or is it all interactive between them? I don't know how else to word that question. Um, the way that we look at it is you can have, um, so allodynia would be where a normal stimulus would be perceived as painful. There's dysesthesia, which means that a normal stimulus is, is not necessarily perceived as painful, but it's perceived differently. Let's say something like that is not necessarily perceived as light touch, but it's perceived as a burning kind of sensation or maybe a numbness kind of sensation. And then there's like hypoesthesia, which means you feel it, but you feel it less. Each one of those things does imply something very different. If you are not sensing as much, the implication is that the nerve itself is not very healthy, that there's some problem in general with the nerve sensation. If you're experiencing uh, dysesthesia, it may be, uh, you know, again, some other kind of problem, but usually very different than not feeling anything at all. So in other words, a, a um, diabetic neuropathy may present, uh, you know, more as a hypoesthesia and other kinds of nerve issues can present as this dysesthesia. Allodynia usually presents as a consequence of very chronic daily kinds of pain. If there's pain uh, very, you know, consistently in a specific area, what'll happen is you'll have what we call central sensitization, where those nerves are constantly sending signals to the brain that are saying, there's pain here, there's pain here, and the brain perceives all of that really as pain. And ultimately, the best option is to treat the underlying pain disorder. There is some evidence for the use of Botox, especially when it's um, allodynia that's because of migraine. Uh, Botox specifically helps that, but it may be helpful for other kinds of allodynia also. Um, and uh, you know, each situation is different, but that's how that would be our approach to that. Yeah, and I'm so sorry for dumping that question on you. When we're really out of time, because I know that's it's okay. a huge topic. I think central sensitization, allodynia, and even neuroplasticity would be a really great topic in the future um, to talk about because there's a lot of questions for that. But I wanted sure. to thank you for coming and joining us today. Absolutely. For taking the time. Um, we really appreciate it. We hope for everybody else who's joined us today and for everyone who, has, who is going to watch this, 
that you have found this helpful. If you have any comments or questions that have not been answered, please let us know in the comments. Occipital and trigeminal neuralgia and of course migraine are all very painful conditions and we encourage you to proactively partner with your doctors. Please do not diagnose yourself. Go and partner with your doctor so you can explore different options. Please also uh, go and explore the resources we have on migraine meanderings and please join us in a future Facebook Live event. Dr. Burke, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it and we look forward to welcoming you back in the future. Thank you.